It didn't take much more than a bottle and two chairs to make a speakeasy. This is what Daniel Okrent said in his book, Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition. Today, join us for some stories. Get your own bottle, glass, mug, and relax. This is Speak Easily, and I'm your host, Krista Stoffer. Hi. Hi. First look, I and saw your curtain looked like a shower curtain, and I'm like, is he in the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish he was. Oh, well, I mean, that would be, we haven't done a bathroom interview yet. You know? I'm not rushing for that one, to be honest. Yeah, I, actually, I won't be your first on that one. Okay. No, I mean, I mean, I wasn't asking for volunteers. I was just saying, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to, I, I guess it would be something that we would want to know ahead of time. You know? Like maybe <laughs> everyone. And if they had an appropriate theme, like. Yeah. Tales from the bathroom. Tales from the bathroom. Yeah. I. <laughs> This is a really- That's our 200th episode is what we're going to do is a bathroom episode with Dino. No, I don't want, I don't want Dino, I don't want really anybody in the bathroom doing an interview. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. We'll talk it's to him about it tomorrow morning. It'd be great. I'm sure. No. Mm -mm. I bet he'd do it. No, that's the problem that he would. <laughs> and then we have Dino in the bathroom. Yeah, we're not going to do that. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so good to see you guys. Well, thank you. We had far, I'm so sorry for the delay. My daughter's school literally just had a gas leak 10 minutes ago. So it was like, um, okay. She's poor thing. I, and you guys have seen pictures of my daughter. She's teeny. And she's like, mom, I'm soaked and I'm so cold. I'm so sorry. She's like, I'm scared. And I said, don't worry about that. The gas, I mean, you're fine. But the cold, and yeah. So if she doesn't get COVID, she's going to get pneumonia probably. Oh, poor so. thing. The joys of a mother, right? Yay. Yeah. So, so we wanted to have you guys had to kind of talk about, this is such a unique experience that you get to do that not a lot of people are getting to do at this moment. So I wanted to bring y'all on and just talk about it. But with us today are my dear friends, Edward and Dan. And it's, it's so good to, I mean, see you, you know, <laughs> as we are. And we have confirmed that Edward is not in the bathroom. I'm the, not, no. I got just a fancy curtain behind me. I do like it, though. I like it a lot. I just wish there was more sun coming from behind it, because this is, what, day three of rain? Like, yeah. killing me. I don't know if it's killing anybody else, or just me. But it's like... Can we just nap the entire day? Oh, no, I'm absolutely ready for someone to come back out, for sure. I think tomorrow it's supposed to. I think it's tomorrow it's going to get better. Yeah, but, the rest of the weekend is nice. I mean, nice for November, right? <laughs> so our, our superstars here have come on to talk about Columbus Immersive Theater doing Rocky Horror Picture Show. Edward, how many times have you directed this one? I've directed it seven times i've worked on the show ten times oh my gosh do you know it like backward and forward at this point i mean yeah and i've also been running the board for this one so like it's, it's in my brain but it, it, i mean the whole show is like 10 lines long it's just you know yeah. full lines connecting songs so that's true <laughs> and the audience helps out quite a bit too <laughs> yeah that's true yeah they the callbacks and all of them sometimes way more than i do that's great when, okay, so I have to ask you first for both of you, what was your first Rocky Horror experience? When did this all start for you in your own life? Whether well, it's the movie or the show or? I mean, it was really weird for me because I remember my father, who's like, you know, very straight and narrow Republican. When I was like 14, it was on television. He was like, oh, you should watch this. <laughs> okay. Um, and so I did, and it was interesting. And I don't remember that being like an event, except sort of like how strange, you know. Um, but then I then I moved to California when I was like 15, 16 years old, and I got with a group of nerdy theater friends, and they all loved it. And I, you know, I I went to see it a few times at the movie theater. We would watch it. I had a, a 16th birthday that was Rocky Horror themed. I remember that. Hi. Um, <laughs> And it wasn't until I like until I started doing summer stock 
that I think, you know, was the first time I did the show and I kind of learned that there were callbacks and that there was like this whole cult following to it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that was my first time really exposed to what the theatrical experience. Oh, no, that's not true. My senior year, I saw it on Broadway. Okay. That, that was that revival that Chris Ashley directed uh, and Jerry Mitchell choreographed back in 2000. Nice. That was the like the first time I, I saw it in the theater and I was like, oh, okay, this is this is cool, you know. Yeah. Um, that was a very neat production, but then I did it a lot. I, you know, I used to, I used to like cover Brad and Frank a lot. So and I would always go on, which was really fun, you know, like to be able to do both of those roles. And I was like twenty, um, and then I started directing, directing and choreographing. I did it once in Long Island and then because the, it, that is such an infectious spread out there every theater in Long Island asked me to come do it that year or the year after and oh, wow. then I just sort of get it in a reputation for the guy that directs Rocky and <laughs> now, now I'm on Rocky number 10. Is that on your business card? <laughs> yeah, yeah no it's weird that Rocky and Hedwig are shows that have opened a lot of doors for me as a director. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'm not really like I don't have this giant affinity for either one of them. You know, I enjoy the shows. I think they're fun, but I wouldn't say they really encapsulate what I'm about as a director. But um, <laughs> you know, you you take what opportunities come to you when they come, right? Oh, absolutely. That's fun, Dan. What was your what was your first Rocky experience? Yeah, Crystal, what a great question. So <laughs> I was 16, um, and which was yesterday. Uh huh. And, um, I was I was in high school and I had I had a group of friends who was really, who were really into Rocky and I I didn't know anything about it but there was a local one screen movie theater in my town who was showing it on Halloween and my friends were like oh my gosh we have to dress up we have to go do this and they didn't have a traditional shadow cast at this um, yeah at the, the showing but my friend group decided that we really wanted to shadow cast just the floor show. And again, I knew literally nothing about Rocky Horror. Like the only thing I had seen that this segment of the floor show over and over and over and over again, because we were trying to get the choreography down perfectly. And I played Brad for that, weirdly. Um, but uh, but that was it. And then the first time I saw the show was that night, which was also the first time I ever got drunk. So if my mom's listening to this, hey, mom. Um, I was 21. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh yeah, and so my friend made costumes and it was the first time I got in like full fishnets, full heels. We went to Charlotte Roos and I bought my first corset, my only corset I've ever spent money on. But, um, and, uh, and yeah, and I remember I used, we tried to replicate the lipstick or the, the makeup as much as possible. And I used lipstick as eyeshadow, which was a poor choice. Um, and then I, the movie started at midnight and I had a shift at McDonald's that next morning at 6 a.m. So I oh went to Rocky Horror, did that, got drunk, and yeah. still somehow made it to my 6 a.m. shift at McDonald's that day. Well, you're 16. You know, you can do that. You have superpowers yeah. when you're 16. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was great. And so that's kind of how I started learning about the callbacks and learning more about it. And then I like it had always sort of been a part of my life. I had actually ironically dressed up as Rocky for Halloween multiple years before I did that movie for the first time with Chicago yeah. Stage, now Columbus Immersive Theater. Um, and so yeah, so then when uh, the, the first Halloween that I can remember not doing Rocky was ironically when I was cast in Rocky Horror. Um, <laughs> I had done the spray tan, bleached my hair, but then for, as a phantom, I didn't want to do that. So I don't remember what I went out that is last year. I think I just wore underwear and called it a costume, but. <laughs> I mean, that works too, right? Yeah. There were some, there were some things that you mentioned and there's not, a, I mean, not everybody knows floor show and callbacks. So yeah. one of you explain some of those lovely little things that, that happened during Rocky Horror. Well, callbacks and I mean, they're really, um, they're really the audience's script what makes Rocky such kind of a fun experience and, and really unique to any other piece of theater is that the audience really has an active role. They're, they're your scene partners. So that can be really great or really awful. <laughs> um, and we, <laughs> we timed the show and we use our phantoms to help us with callbacks too, just so that there's some rhythm to the show. Um, otherwise you're leaving spaces and uh, with a bad audience that so does it, not a bad audience, an audience that doesn't know the callbacks uh, can make the show really slow. So we, we added people to kind of prompt that. 
um, and give them a little courage because sometimes they know them, but they're like, assholes, <laughs> <laughs> like under their breath, and they don't want they don't want to be loud about it. Yeah. Um, so they need a little courage with that. Uh, I think that's really kind of cool because you know every show is absolutely different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is based on how active the audience is. And then in addition to the callbacks, there's also props you can throw on the stage at certain times. And all of that was sort of built out of, well, here's, here's your history of Rocky Horror, right? So it, it, in 1974, it was first produced off, brought, or off the West End, I should say, in, in London at a small little theater uh, for 65 seats, wow. which is why the show is so intimate, you know? And it got this cult following and then eventually traveled to Broadway and, and wasn't really successful in New York. Um, and then they made the film and that really made it take off. And that was around 75, 76. So uh, it, with that, because it was such a B film and took a really long time to catch on, people started going and just making fun of it. And that's where the callbacks came from. And it was sort of like born out of that culture. Yeah. Um, where it, it, it wasn't a great film and people decided to fill in the blanks with things that made it better. Uh, and now, I don't know. I mean, now I think it's, it's really, if you look back on it, it's such a great piece of history in film. You know, it really does represent an idea that I don't think they were ready for in 1975, which is how to sexualize B horror movies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is great. I mean, like, if you came up with that idea today, people would be so on board with it. Oh, like, absolutely. The time way before kinky boots, way before, uh, you know, all of the, the drag that is so a part of our lives right now. And that was really subversive and really out there. So yeah. I think that's what, my dog is annoying the crap out of me. So <laughs> the devil really wants to be on this podcast. Hi, puppy. Uh, <laughs> this is the dog. We still need to have a dog play date. Yes, we, we do. Yeah, so basically, like the people that have never seen it before, is it a challenge for them? I mean, I've seen it. I've, I've seen the movie a couple of times. I've now seen the show, I think every year at Short North and now Columbus Immersive. Tomorrow, I'll be there tomorrow. I'm excited. Um, but how, is it hard for people that haven't seen it to understand what's going on? Or do you think people are just kind of open to a strange experience? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, Dan. I think, I think people... I think there's a really basic plot, right? Like it is the American storyline that exists in Lacage that, it, you know, it's two square people going into a subversive environment and watching them sort of just write it out. That, that happens at a lot of movies and plays, yeah. right? I mean, it's, it's the, the ultimate basic storyline. So I don't think it's hard to follow. What's a little difficult about it is, is the why, you know, like, what is Rocky? What is Eddie? That that takes a little more uh, research, I think, a little more explanation than's given in the show. You know that he's a Frankenstein, you know, basically a drag Frankenstein, and he's creating these monsters that are his playmates uh, and his sexual toys. You know, and one of them doesn't work out, and one of them is Rocky, who turns out to not be the right sexuality and goes after Janet. And you know, so like those little details are lost. I think as a whole. You know, I, I just talked to one of our, our straight board members the other day who was like saw it for the first time last week and, and really enjoyed it. And I was like, so what did you think? He goes, you know, I don't know. You just sort of like get on board for the whole experience of what it is. You know, it's not yeah. I don't think it's, it matters all that much if you're catching every last detail because it's not, you know, it's not Ibsen. It's just <laughs> <laughs> I think you just kind of get the gist of it and then you go for the ride and you either love it or you walk out of the theater terrified. And, I, you know, personally, I think that when I saw the movie and my, Ben, I want to ask you years too, but I think I saw it back junior year of high school. It seems like junior year is the time to see it. Maybe that's a. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. I worked at the movie theater in Gehanna at that time and we did midnight screenings of it. And it was kind of like, you know, I had, I had some friends who were like, oh, have you ever seen Rocky Horror? And I'm like, no, I never heard of it. And okay, well, go see this thing. And I mean, first time in a movie theater seeing it, and you're like, what is all of this? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's an experience for sure. But I haven't seen it in a long time. It'd be fun to see it again. Yeah. It's, again, junior year. That must be like your point of reference for <laughs> seeing Rocky Horror, that's it. But we, when I watched it on the, the movie, it was kind of like, yeah, okay. But seeing it live was, I mean, and I agree with what the board member said. It was like, you just sort of get on board. 
And even though it's, you know, sometimes when everybody's doing one thing or everybody's yelling things out, you're kind of on occasion in any different experience, you would feel left out. This was just kind of like, boom, 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 boom. It was fun to see the action on the stage, but then the action in the audience as well. Yeah. So it's almost like as a, just watching everything happen, there's almost two different shows going on at the same time. That to me is the most interesting. And that I didn't feel stupid for not knowing the callbacks. It was okay to just enjoy it. I don't know, Dan, do you think that this, um, that this, this experience is, does it scare anybody? Do you ever see people in the audience from the stage that are like terrified or? <laughs> I mean, I, I, the other, it's funny that you say that because um, I work at Ohio State and I work with a lot of different students. And one of my students came to see the show last week and she said that one of her friends texted her and said, on a scale of one to 10, how scared were you? And what she meant was it's called the Rocky Horror Show. So she was nervous that it was like, you know, we're intentionally scaring the audience. And it's like, well, it could be scary, but not quite in that way. Um, but no, I think that when, you know, when I have people who come see the show and don't know anything about it, I usually just prep them with, it's, it's, it's a Frankenstein, it's literally the Frankenstein story and just in a different way. Um, the plot's not really that difficult to follow if you don't think about it too hard. Um, and you know, when it comes to callbacks, as long as you know, asshole and slut, then you'll have a good time. I mean, yeah, yeah I like that. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, I, I think it's such a fascinating sociological and cultural experience. You know, people who are so straight and narrow or even anti-gay or, you know, in, in, any, in any way can go to this thing. And somehow this is like, this gets a pass on all that. Like Amy Kona Barrett could go see this and she'd probably still enjoy it somehow, you know? And I, think, I, I mean, I think, yes, it is, it is crazy and out there. It absolutely explores lots of homosexual themes. But at the same time, it's like, oh, but it's Tim Curry, you know, <laughs> like you sort of just give it a pass because it's so absurd. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't really say that it's like advocating for any anybody's specific rights or anything like that. I think it, it, it's an apolitical piece. Sometimes we make it a little more political, but as written, it's not it's not like that. I mean, some of the callbacks are political, but I, at the script as written really isn't about um you know, pride or anything like that. It's just like absurd. It's just an absurd situation that he probably wrote under a lot of drugs and then became this <laughs> crazy event that happens all the time, all over the world, you know? I think what I like about it too is it just gives you permission to just enjoy it. You know, how, how often do we sit and do theater? And yeah, I mean, I get it, I do too, but theater that makes you think. This is just like, just enjoy it. Yeah. Just enjoy the ride. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, the other thing is it's the only thing left over from the glam movement of the 70s where heterosexual men had no issue wearing eyeshadow because David Bowie was doing it, right? Oh, because, yeah. You know, like that sort of like small pocket of time, even in America, especially in London, but really in America as well, where men weren't threatened by, you know, like things that were traditionally called female or or yeah. gay um, because it was a really huge part of pop culture and then it went away and now there's almost nothing left like that except for Rocky Horror which is yeah. kind of cool. So you have the unique experience of having done this with I mean most of the cast is returning I know each year there's a couple changes here and there but I mean most of your cast has done it at least once before is that right? Yeah, so we, we've done this at Shortener Stage a number of times. This year, um, Shortener Stage is taking a break from live performance because of our uh, collective bargaining agreement with Actors' Equity. Um, but the Garden Theater is able to be opened by the state, and Columbus Immersive Theater is essentially an actors' collective we created years ago that would allow us to do non-union productions that you know sort of act as fundraisers. Yeah. Um, you know, so through that, this group of artists that has always been a part of Columbus Immersive Theater um, decided, we got together and decided, you know, this year we still want to do Rocky and we can do it at the Garden, so let's yeah. do it, you know? And if Shortener Stage can, obviously as the artistic director of Shortener Stage, I support the project. Um, I directed the project, but I still think um, the differentiation is mainly just because we're living in a world where 
uh, the union has not yet made up its mind about when live performance can resume, and, and they are acting like the sheriffs in town that are going <laughs> to tell everybody when when they get to get back on stage. Uh, so that's that's the way it is. But I'm really happy that Columbus Immersive Theater was able to get a group of actors together who knew the show um, that could just you know produce it on their own and uh, make it happen this year because we've sold out the whole run. Yeah. So it shows that there is an audience. Of, and it's not just younger people. What I've been really surprised at is seeing 60s uh, people in their 60s and 70s coming to the show dressed up, ready to go, <laughs> masks on. You know, everyone's wearing a mask. Everyone's socially distanced. You know, we have masks and shields on stage. But uh, I, I think that there is a safe way to get back to theater. And, and I, I have to say that I kind of wanted to show this, this town that that was possible. And I hope that this... Um, I know that other companies are now moving forward with their ideas to do socially distant performances. Um, so I think that's exciting. You know, there's there's a way to, for theater to survive this pandemic. And I think the way is for a small theaters to rise and yeah. say, we can do it. We know that the large theaters can't, right? 15% makes absolutely no sense for Kappa or for any of those large theaters or Broadway or any of that. But for a 280 seat house like the Garden, there's a way to do certain kinds of performances in that space uh, that will, you know, slowly allow us to limp through. Absolutely. And that's why I'm so excited for you guys is just to see something happening. You know, and I think what I've heard, I, I spoke to Jeb and he said it was just, I almost was brought to tears. Excuse me, I have a guest in the house. Hi, sir. Can you go back to your room and hang out? Hi, Gabe. My Nintendo is dead. I'm sorry to hear that. You're going to have to find something to do, okay? I don't have any. Here, I'm going to give you my phone. Excuse the delay. <clears throat> this is called a day off of school. Okay? Uh oh. Here we go. Bye. Yay. Sorry about that. Anyhow, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, What is so cool to see you guys trying something completely brand new. That, that nobody else has done. And I know that there's been a couple other companies that have tried a couple of things um, that have gone well or not gone well, but everybody's watching. And I, you guys have done such a good job of really showing like, no, we're, we are being safe, you know, with the, fe the face shields and the masks and when they're not singing. How did you have to do all of that? Obviously you probably had to block things differently. A bit, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was really important to me, uh, you know, because I, I essentially am responsible for Columbus Immersive Theater, over the, even though I think of it as an actor's collective of all of us sort of being responsible. You know, the, if the buck stops with me, it's really important to me that this that theater stays safe, that the actors are safe. They were all tested before coming into rehearsal, you know, and that during the entire time, I, I've been really proud of everyone for for staying um safe wearing their masks in rehearsals mm -hmm. you know we have uh, a special kind of shield that we wear in performance but really we didn't start using those until the last minute um and then the staging became like where is it really in a i mean because rocky horror is all about touching and being close and you know where can we find places that uh, allow us to get that same idea across like there are sex scenes in act two right and yeah. now we just have them in basically like separate twin beds acting like the action of the stage left bed affects the action of the stage right bed. You get it immediately, right? Like it's not hard to understand why we're separating the bed. And it's it's not really hard to understand like, okay, I get that his thrust means that she's. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, I, and, it, and it becomes funny and the whole show sort of lives in that humorous meta environment about we're living in a pandemic, we have to be safe. Um, not because anybody's telling us to be safe, but because it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think it makes an audience more comfortable to go and see like, okay, you know, nobody's grinding on each other in this Rocky Horror, but we're still getting that same subversive experience. How do you feel on stage, Dan? Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny that you say that. The on stage, honestly, I feel um, particularly safe. A lot of, I mean, number one, obviously, because we're wearing some sort of face um, covering throughout the entire show. But I do like how much we're sort of leaning into COVID-19 too, um, because I think that some of the theater companies, both in central Ohio, but also just like in the world, who have either gotten a lot of scrutiny or have had unsuccessful productions have been because they've intentionally ignored COVID-19. They have been trying, like, I mean, there's plenty of theater companies, but one that comes to mind is uh, 
theater company a couple months ago did a production of Mamma Mia somewhere in, 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 the, in the Midwest. And, you know, half the cast came down with COVID because they did absolutely nothing to try to prevent it. And, and in this show, um, not only do we have facial coverings and some of the blocking is of course uh, different, um, but we like just leaning into the humor that you can try to find in this <laughs> current place in our society, I think really just adds so much to both the actors and the audience. One particular moment that I think of is um, right after I finished my first song, um, you know, I'm wearing a face shield because it's much easier to sing with a face shield than it is with a mask. Um, but after I'm done um, on stage, I have a brief moment where I take off the face shield and then Frankenfurter has a gold mask that matches the rest of my limited costume and immediately puts it onto um, my face. And the first on opening night, it got a laugh. And I did not expect that at all. Um, but every night the audience chuckles at the fact that it happens. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, I mean, I guess it's funny, number one, because of COVID. But number two, I like that, you know, we live in this world where wearing masks in public is just a thing. And so for Rocky Horror, why not also make that a thing? Like Rocky was just born. We live in a world where we wear masks. Now Rocky gets his mask. And that's just how it works. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a really cute moment. And so I think obviously when we're singing, we're wearing the face shields because it's far easier to sing with one. But in the scenes where we are either just dancing or just speaking or just present and we're not singing, um, we wear some or some sort of other mask that works with our costumes. And I think that allows for a lot of really cool creativity, um, particularly during the floor show when we have our light up LED masks, which are really fun. So Chris, I look forward to you seeing those. Um, but no, I feel really, really safe on stage. Well, and it's also fun that Rocky wears more on his face than he does on his body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was kind of um, hoping that Edward would um, change the costume this year and I would wear a mask on my face and also a mask, you know, everywhere Where? else. Where? Um, but, uh, you know, we, we moved from that. <laughs> so, yeah, Dan, you get to... Uh... You get to stay a little chilly on stage because uh, you're not. Well, ironically, I still end up sweating more than everyone else, I feel like. Um, but uh, but that's also because as soon as I get on stage, I immediately have baby oil put all over me. So sometimes I can't really tell if it's sweat or oil, but either way, it <laughs> glistens for sure. Sounds like a personal problem there, too. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. That's so much fun. And have you played this role before? Because you were a phantom last year. So kind of. Um, my first year when Edward asked me to do this, I was um, I was a phantom. My second year, I was also a phantom almost the entire time. Uh, but our Rocky last year had two performances where he injured himself at work and wasn't able to come in. Um, and so I remember I was at work, I was in a committee meeting, and I got a text message from our stage manager that said, hey, you're going on as Rocky tonight. And I immediately could not focus on the rest of that committee meeting. I cannot tell you what we talked about that day. Um, but yeah, as soon as we were done, I went home and Fortunately, Rocky is a pretty easy role to cover. Um, the, he had, I think I had eight lines in the show. Um, and he has one full song, which I've had memorized since I was 16. Um, and, uh, and then it was just a little bit of choreography during the floor show that I was most worried about, but yeah. That's so funny. Mm -hmm. Edward, you said that you played some of the roles before. You played Brad and you played Rocky. Mm -hmm. Which one did you, did, was there one you preferred or is there a role that you didn't get to try that you would want to try? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't, I know long, I mean, I had a professional career as an actor, but I no longer have any desire to, to be on stage. It happens sometimes, yeah. uh, but, but rarely because I advocate for it. Uh, so no, I, I feel like I've, I'm much happier directing and choreographing Rocky for the rest of my life. I don't need to play anybody again. Uh, but I will say that it was really great to play both, just for the experience of playing Brad and Rocky at different times, different productions. Um, and, I, and mind you, I was always a cover. So I was always a phantom, right? And it was always like, oh, Rocky's or uh, Brad's not on tonight and Frank's not on tonight. Um, which is my whole career, always the bridesmaid, you know, always the woman, always the understudy. Uh, but uh, I, I think they're really different characters because an effective Brad is, is a straight man, right? Like not, not a heterosexual man, but like a straight man in comedy, right? They have to let things happen to them. And yeah. if they lean into the joke too much, they kind of ruin it, right? So I think that like to be Brad, you have to be like 
uh, what I what did I tell Zach the other day? Our our Brad, I said it 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 has his inner monologue is like I'll do this because I'm a good sport, right? Yeah. Like this is what nice guys do. Mm -hmm. I'll go along with this person touching me because that's what guys do. But secretly, sort of fostering this inner homosexual, right? This this inner desire, at least, to be uh, a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like getting pinned down by your sister to put makeup on your face. You know, you're like, please don't know. But if you're a little gay boy, you're like, yes, I want this. <laughs> <laughs> and then Frank is the exact opposite. Like Frank has, Frank is the catalyst between the audience and the cast. Mm -hmm. So he needs to be there to sort of like give permission to a lot of it. And he's the superstar. I mean, he comes on and people cheer for him and he is, he is there to entertain and to guide the other characters through the storytelling. And I think if he doesn't play for laughs, it also ruins it. Yeah. So the really different experiences on stage, right? Like one where you have to be totally conservative and resist every opportunity to play into the joke. And the other one where you're like, lean into it further, make it dirtier, make it worse than yeah. it's written, right? Like that, that is really awesome. I mean, I, I remember, and this was back in my early 20s, but I remember as a young actor thinking, wow, how cool, you know, how cool that in this same production, I can play two totally different things. And yeah. maybe that's why I was always an understudy because I, <laughs> I didn't mind, I thought it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> and to be, I mean, be told to go even more over the top as an actor, when do you ever hear that? <laughs> What is dangerous, right? Like the wrong, and like we are so blessed to have Nick Harden as our Frank Porter because year after year, he proves that he can adapt to whatever is thrown at him yeah. and still come out of it such a, a winning personality, you know? Yeah. And he plays a lot of drag characters. You know, he's done a lot of our Charles Bush plays. He was Frau Blucher and, and Young Frankenstein. And he knows how to uh, make each individual character different, despite the fact that they're all drag roles, right? Like yeah. there is always a very specific interpretation of whatever he's playing on stage, male or female. Yeah. Um, and he's just kind of a joy to work with. He has great ideas. He makes great choices. He brings a lot to the table, but he's not a pain in the ass. He doesn't show you that he's acting or he doesn't show you that he's doing his homework. He just comes in and he does it. And he sets a really great model for everybody and for any young actors that we bring into a show with him. It's, it's a great role model, right? Somebody like, just do your job, do it well, and don't brag about it. Don't have an ego about it. Don't show the rest of the cast and the director that you researched really hard or you practiced a, a million times. You just come in and you do your stuff. And that's how people will be drawn to you, you know? And I certainly am drawn to him as a director, but I think audiences and casts have always loved it. Audiences, and I will say, cast have always loved Dan Coleman too because he is just about the best company manager or company person member you can ever have because he brings, he's like the cheerleader, like the spirit coordinator. Any, you know, Christmas shows, he's always the one organizing secret Santas. And, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, so we love having Dan Coleman in a cast too. And I think that's, you know, especially with Columbus Immersive, that's about actors giving back to theaters that, um, we're giving back to the garden theater specifically for the opportunities that we get to work with them creatively. Um, and so for us to be able to take over something and fundraise with it, um, it's really great to have a company of actors that are so game and, and so fun to be around and, and it doesn't feel like work, you know? Probably even, even now too, though, with, you know, just, just hearing, I was talking to Adam the other night that he's, he said, it's just so beautiful to be doing something again. Mm -hmm. How important it is for everybody on stage. And I'm sure even more so that they're actually getting to give and give it. And I'm sure your audience has re have responded to that. It's so nice to see something again. Well, I think this pandemic has done a terrible thing to our industry, obviously, right? Um, I think that there's a silver lining here, which is I don't think anybody on stage in this production or anybody who worked on it or any of anything that we've done recently uh, through short and stage with virtual productions, we all kind of have the same perspective is we will never take this for granted again. Mm -hmm. When I was 20, I remember an older actress coming to me and saying, Never wish away a show because you don't know when there never will be another one. And I was like, yeah, right. I got I got 10 shows lined up this year. I'm fine. Whatever. I'm so bored with this production of Damn Yankees. I can't wait to move on. Right now. I really get it. Now I get that when you when you aren't able to do your creative thing, it's devastating. Mm 
Yeah. And that we are so lucky to, you know, like I have a full-time job in the theater. I, th I think you do too, Chris. I mean, I think that is such a gift mm -hmm. um, that I, I'm not sure I ever believed I'd, I'd have in my life. Even when I was in between waiting tables and then, you know, going on tour or whatever I was doing as a young actor, you know, I always thought, well, there's the uptime and the downtime. And, and now to have this job and then to have everything creative taken away from you, it just makes you think like, never complain ever again, yeah. right? Like never, I will, I, I swear it every day I go to that light board and I'm like, oh, it's the seventh show of the week and I've got to run the board and boohoo. I'm like, nope, love it, soak it in because in a week there's no more theater for an indefinite amount of time. <laughs> yeah, I, it's not what I want to hear, but <laughs> you're absolutely right. You know, we had, um, was it just last week, Ben, or was that this week? Every day runs together. I have no idea. Anyway, we had Billy Zen, who's a fabulous local musician in and we sat socially distant and did our podcast that way. And he played and he played oh. this beautiful song called uh, Goodbye, My Friends. And I'm doing everything I can. I'm just listening to him and taking in the fact that this is the first time that I have actually heard somebody, a performer, performing right there. And before I know it, it's just like tears just streaming down my face. It's, I forgot how important that is how the live experience just transforms you so much. We, you're right, we take it for granted. When we've got, oh, I can't come see your show because I've got five others this weekend. I, I'm so sorry, you know, then there's nothing. <laughs> well, what's worse about it too is that, you know, there is an audience that's ready to come out to see Rocky Horror. I think there's also an audience that really wants to, but isn't, does not feel safe being in public. And we, we get that, we totally understand that, you know? And I think that unfortunately, our business will have to deal with that for years to come. Um, I don't think that once the pandemic is over, people are going to like flip a switch and automatically want to be in a room with 3000 people. I, I just don't. I hope we do a little better at CACO and shortener stage because we have smaller venues, but um, I, I don't know. I think that this is something we're going to have to live with for years to come. And that because we've all become hypochondriacs now, um, there's a, there's a heightened awareness of gatherings and you know, that's, that's going to, be a difficult road to navigate. However, I think, you know, innovation is key. Um, safety is key, making sure that our theaters are really taking care of our patrons and our artists. I mean, that's what will matter in the end. And that's probably what will get us over this hump. Yeah. Well, and you've done such a good job with, <laughs> you've done a lot. I mean, you, Edward, have not stopped since this started. <laughs> it kind of feels like you went, well, shit, this sucks. Okay, now what do we do? And that's what I've loved. <laughs> you know, you responded so quickly, probably because you, like me, can't sit still for very long. <laughs> like, yeah, just it. It out. <laughs> but short of this, you've done now two separate streamed performances. Yeah, virtual productions. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, is that the future for you, do you think? For a little while, we're doing a virtual Christmas show called Quarantine with the Clauses that we're really excited about. Mark Waldrop wrote it, who writes the Radio City Music Hall show every year and, and can't this year. Um, and he wrote When Pigs Fly, so we sort of developed a relationship with him. And he's wrote this, this hilarious song where uh, Santa is basically Johnny Carson and Mrs. Claus is like a drunk Ed McMahon. And they wrote like 14 new songs and numbers for the show and big tap numbers. And there's ways to involve our interns and our locals. So I think it's going to be quite the event to see. Um, but what I'm really proud of with Short North Stage is that we've taken this opportunity to connect, to try and get a bigger regional representation, you know, working with Andrew Lippa on uh, John and Jen, for instance, and then you know, just seeing our name in the Broadway briefing or in Playbill.com, as small as that is, was sort of exciting. It's sort of like, okay, we, instead of just disappearing, now we're one of the only theaters in America doing anything. So people just for a lack of things to watch are watching what we're doing. And I think that's kind of cool. And, and it's good for Columbus as a whole, because it allows people to realize what this town is, like what we're doing up here. I loved pigs because we get to showcase all these costume designers that do highball and, you know, people don't know about that. I didn't know about that before. The first time I came to Columbus, I had no idea what was going on in this town. And while <laughs> I like that it's a little secret, I don't think we're ever going to become the theater town we aspire to be um, until we start getting more national recognition. Uh, so that we can start making CACO and Shortener Stage Lort theaters in 10 or 15 years, you know, and, 
and have the sort of resources that Cleveland and Cincinnati already have. Right. Um, and I think that, that that should be the goal of Columbus because we're such a cool arts town. But every time I tell someone back in New York about it, they're sort of like, oh, Columbus, I've never been there. You know, it's it's a sea tour stop. You know, if you've been on tour, you don't you don't often stop in Columbus because, it you know, it, it's usually the third or fourth year of the tour when it gets around here. So I think that there's there needs to be more awareness of what a cool town it is and, and what we're doing here. And um, I'm just so enchanted. I still feel like a guest six years in, like I'm still you know, new here, but uh, I think it's such a neat place. And I think that it's on us to tell the rest of the world what a cool place it is so that our property values will rise and rise. Well, yes, <laughs> but, you know, that's, I, I think you're right. It is our responsibility and this may be the time to do it because nobody else can. Right. You know? So like you said, people are watching it just because, well, I just want something to do. Well, and you, when you say that people are watching, I mean, the amount of um, messages that I've received from people with different theater companies that I've worked with before in Columbus yeah. saying, how did you do this for Rocky Horror? How did you do this for Rocky Horror? How did you do this for Rocky Horror? I was literally texting a president of a different theater company right before this yeah. who was asking me, where are these masks? Where did you get them? How much are they? What do you do with them? What did, like, I mean, just asking all the different ways that we're trying or that we are being COVID conscious. Um, in this production, um, uh, you know, yeah, Edward, you know, take what you will from this, but you are really leading the way for what theater looks like in Central Ohio with doing this. And I know I, I probably speak for the rest of the cast when I say that I'm very happy to be a guinea pig um, in this scenario, because if, if this means that we're going to get back to some sort of what theater used to be in Columbus, then I'm all here for it. Yeah. Well, thanks, Dan. I mean, I... I, I, I wish I could say it wasn't partially selfish. I just get bored really easily, you know? And, <laughs> and I think also that, you know, we, we need to recognize that theater doesn't exist without artists, without actors, without people willing to mitigate risk, but still, you know, not stay sheltered through this time and put themselves out there on stage. And I think we're lucky to have a group that does that. Um, and I, and I, I've never experienced the kind of community of artists that I've seen here in Columbus. You know, I've worked in a lot of Midwestern cities. I, I, I think that we're so unique. And I think part of the reason is because we have a wealth of local talents that a lot of cities don't have. Um, and I think that also just there's a community of people who really care about what we're doing, but also about being an artist group. Um, that makes me so proud to be a part of what we're doing here. And, and, and I plan to continue. And we will rise again. You know, I, I, know, I know you work for CatCo and you guys are, are dealing with the same struggles that we are. I, I appreciate that Union is being safe. I really do. I don't mean to, to throw shade. I think that they're trying to do the right thing. I think it's now time for us to be like, okay, it's been eight months. It's time to start figuring out how to get people back to work. Mm -hmm. Like I have a lot of artist friends, a lot of actor friends in the Union. I'm a former member, you know, like that really, uh, that are really in a place where they're they've lost their insurance they can't get their health care you know they're broke they're they don't want to work in a restaurant because it's you know they feel less safe in a restaurant than they do in a theater like it's time it's time for a turning point in america with this yeah. you know and i think that's coming um we need to find a way to get actors back to work and musicians back to work and it's not just those on stage but you think about the ushers and the technical people and the iatsi crews and all these things that that have lost their work because of this it's you know we owe it to figure out a way to move forward because this pandemic may last another year i mean i know that's a horrible thing to say and i hope it's not true but like it, it may be a reality and if we're waiting for things to get better i think that america has proved that that's not going to happen i think regardless of our president obviously i, I hope that our our next president does a better job but uh I still think that there's there's a part of this that's nature, you know, it's mother yeah. nature and there's very little that we can do to fight mother nature. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously Americans have an issue and they've made this political and all of that making things worse. But the baseline thing is that this this disease, this this pandemic is going to run its course, you know, mm -hmm. and we'll we'll do what we can to, to make it go quicker and to mitigate the risk while it's here. But we need to find a way to get back to work in theater or theater stands a really good chance of just not ever returning. And I think that's scary. That's really scary. And that's something that we talked about as our staff here, you know, it's sort of like in all of history, when challenges have happened and, and 
humanity is at a tipping point, what has survived but the arts? Now they come out looking a little bit different, but they've never gone away. They've, they've come stronger, they've become new, but the arts have always survived anything. I, I mean, I think you're right. It's it's going to look different. It's going to feel different, and it may never get back to a three thousand seat theater filled. But it's still you know it it will. That will happen eventually. I mean, Broadway is is in a rough place. It I, Midtown doesn't exist without Broadway. Even if it takes another two years to come back, it mm -hmm. will come back. It's the regional theaters that I'm really worried about. You know, we don't have the same amount of resources. And it's a lot easier for small cities to turn theaters into parking lots than it is for Midtown to turn Broadway into a parking lot. You know, I think that there's there's a difference between those two things and that that has to be recognized. And I agree, theater has always survived, you know, since the Greeks. We've always come through. Civilizations fall, but live entertainment stays around. And I guess that the question now is, like, in the age of the internet and with television and with, you know, even this is being the first pandemic since there was really a lot of attendance in movie theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, does that make a difference? Does the, you know, does theater just transition into film and television? And I disagree. I mean, I think what we've seen with Rocky is that the live experience of seeing live actors on stage and in the audience, it, it will never go away because it's such a unique thing and it's not niche. It's a human yeah. need for people that need it. And virtual theater is great. We love virtual theater. We've done it. The reality of it is it, it just doesn't make enough money. You know, people do not buy tickets to that sort of thing when they can watch Broadway HD. So you have to really either be devoted to your company that's producing it or really interested in whatever product they're producing. Yeah. Um, but we can't compete with Netflix. You know, we don't have the millions of dollars to do that. And no regional theater really can. So I think that we will have to find a way to come back to live seating soon. Um, that this will help us limp through, that virtual productions are a great way to continue to connect with your audiences um, and to keep people engaged. But, and I fully, I want to put this out there, please support any theater doing anything yeah. virtually. It may not be your first choice of entertainment this weekend, but consider that if you're, you're investing in a future of live theater, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I think that's really important to put out there. Uh, and there's some great things going on, you know, at any given day, you can see a concert of your favorite Broadway star now because they're everywhere. They're doing them everywhere. Every theater is, has hired Broadway stars to come do virtual stuff for them. So I think that's kind of a cool time period too. Uh -huh. Um, but it, it does have to come back. I mean, what we have to offer the world is live theater and live theater will return. It absolutely will. So this is the last, this is the last weekend of Rocky, right? Are there any seats left or is it completely sold out? Yes, oddly, because um, on on Halloween day, there are like, I think now like 15 seats left for those two performances. Okay. So go snatch them up right now. Yes. RockyHorrorColumbus.com. Um, but uh, yeah, we're very lucky that this, you know, even though we only had 44 seats to sell, we did seven shows a week and they all sold out. So we're, we're pretty happy about that. That's amazing. And you've got, I, I saw the picture, you have mannequin parts separating the seats. Yeah. <laughs> A little homage to the film. Uh, <laughs> and we happen to have an endless collection of mannequins. Uh, yes. Mannequins have all, were all part of our original set design in the green room. Um, and we just collected so many of them that we thought that would be a really great way to to keep the audience socially distant and still kind of feel like there's some somebody oh, out there. I mean, sure, it's a great way to keep the audience socially distant, great. But as an actor, it is it, it makes the house feel a lot fuller. It, I mean, it really, really does, especially when just, you know, you're seeing the audience from the corner of your eye and you're not necessarily like staring at them like you normally wouldn't. It helps a lot. Yeah, it's also funny. <laughs> It's hilarious. It's a great sight gag when you walk in the theater. It's also terrifying for me. Like, you know, sometimes late at night, I'll go back to the theater to just get work done or whatever. And, uh, you know, the minute you walk in and it's they're white mannequins, so they just immediately pick up light and you're like, ah, ha, ha. oh, right, right. OK, right. <laughs> That's what you need at this time of year. Yeah, exactly. Gracious. And so audience members, you know, I mean, are, masks, obviously, the whole time. Mm -hmm and just distancing and all that. So the audience feels safe too. And that's, I have heard that from audience members saying, yeah, it was, I felt completely safe and felt like they did everything. 
I mean, we feel it's safer than a restaurant or a grocery store right now. I mean, you know, it's 44 people in a very large auditorium and, you know, everybody's maxed up. We're really strict about that. And I, I think it's kind of fun because people have found ways to incorporate <laughs> their masks into their costumes. And in all ways, it's just kind of the perfect show to bring back in this environment. You know, we know that people love it already and uh, people will jump over great logs to get to Rocky Horror. So wearing a mask is a pretty small obstacle. And I think in general, wearing a mask is a pretty small obstacle, but that's how I feel about masks. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, guys, I'm so proud of you. I, I love the work that you're doing. I'm so excited to see it tomorrow. I'm glad that there was a- I'm glad you're coming. Yeah, you can't wait. I don't know when, but I'll be there at some point. Um, yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep reinventing and, and challenging. And because I know that it's, it is needed so badly. And, and even if people aren't quite ready to get out there to know that there is something that will continue just to develop and grow and be understood is a wonderful thought. So thank you guys so much. We're so proud of you. And we're going to get this out today so that we can get those 15 seats sold for you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Krista. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, guys. Thanks You're for welcome, coming. Guys. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Foxland Media. Think big.